Hello there, my sorcerous friends, and welcome once more to another episode in my Magnus the Red Primarch miniseries. Having talked about things from Magnus' youth to his greatest folly, it was inevitable that we would end up at one of the greatest battles and most significant events from the Horus Heresy, and why not the whole of 40k history. And by that I'm referring to the Battle and Fall of Prospero. This video will be dedicated to covering most of that battle, up to the climax of a duel between Primarchs, and the sealing of the Thousand Suns' fate. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us see what Lehman Rust did to Prospero, shall we? Shortly after the orbital bombardment began, the Imperial invaders arrived by the Thousand. Wave after wave of dropships, assault boats, and gunships sped inbound to the planet's surface. Behind them came bulkier cargo transports bearing armored vehicles and artillery pieces. The kind shields of the Raptora cult could not protect Tiska from the attack, but their cover was no longer needed. The bombardment from orbit had ceased, and squadrons of Stormbird gunships led the charge. Hundreds of Imperial craft flew over the churning seas, leaving foaming breakers in their wake. The idea that any enemy could reach the surface of Prospero to launch an assault had been discounted, and as a consequence, there were no Prosperine anti-aircraft batteries to meet the oncoming invader. The first gunship to land, an enormous stormbird with steel grey sides and the image of twin wolves painted on its blunt prow, smashed into the eastern quarter of the capital, that was known as Old Tiska, blasting its way in with a salvo of missiles and a blast of cannon fire. Landing skids deployed at the last second, and the aircraft came down in the wreckage. No sooner had it set down, than the assault ramps dropped and Lehman Ross himself set foot on Prospero. Two enormous Fenrisian wolves howled at his side, and a score of his most powerful Astartes fought their way into the port. As the space wolves drew first blood, Prospero's military responded. The citizen militia of Tiska rose in defense of their city, gathering what arms they could and taking up firing positions on rooftops and at the windows. No one was fool enough to think that they would be anything more than irritants to the Space Wolves, but to let the invaders simply walk into Tiska without a fight was as abhorrent as it was unthinkable. The Imperial Army regiments of the Prospering Spire Guard attempted to bear the brunt of the Astartes' assault, meeting the barbarian warriors of the Space Wolves bravely but futilely on the field of battle. The Spire Guard, already on high alert after the commencement of the orbital bombardment, moved out en masse under the guidance of the Thousand Suns' Corvidae cult. Ordered to defend Tiska, they did not falter from that order, despite the overwhelming odds arrayed against them. Elements of the 15th Prospering Assault Infantry, under Captain Sokem Vithara, occupied the upper slopes of Old Tiska. Anchoring their defense between the fire-reeved pyramid of the Pyrrhae cult, the Skelmis Pholus, which lay a kilometer to the west of their position, and the Corvidae cult's own pyramid. Vifara set up his command post in the vestibule of the Cretis Gallery, the oldest repository of artwork and sculpture on Prospero. In the southwest quadrant of the city, the Prospero assault pioneers rallied what little was left of their soldiers after the avalanches caused by the orbital shelling swallowed three of their barracks. The northern Palatine Guard deployed on the edges of the burning port, occupying high parapets which overlooked the libraries and art galleries of the Nephrate district. Their commander, Caton Afia, was the heir apparent of one of Prospero's oldest families. He anchored his defense on the Cafiera Tholus, and positioned his troops with a tactical acumen that would have been lauded at any Imperial Army officer's column. Lehman Ross and his Space Wolves overran Afea's position in less than two minutes. Tiska burned as dawn's light crept over the horizon. Yet, Though the Space Wolves had struck an overwhelming blow, they had yet to face the city's true defenders. 
the Thousand Suns deployed, and suddenly the fight took on a very different character. Old Tiska was no more. The peaceful warren of antiquated streets was now ashes and rubble. Warriors picked careful paths through the smoldering ruins, firing from the hip or fighting with chain axe and chain sword. The coastline was invisible, obscured by fog banks of artillery fire. What had once been a wondrous beacon of illumination for all who cared to look upon it was now a maelstrom of battle. Though the majority of the Spire Guard had been swept away in the opening moments of the battle, the Thousand Sons rallied magnificently and prevented the battle from becoming a rout. A thin line of Astartes in crimson power armor linked the six pyramids of Tesca, forming a circular perimeter with Oculum Square at the center. The Pyramid of Fotep was the southernmost of the pyramids, the glittering water surrounding it awash with sudden pages of ancient wisdom lost forever in the name of fear. However, the Thousand Sons were dying. Scores of them died in the opening minutes of the Wolf King's attack, his fury unstoppable and his power immeasurable. Clad in the finest suit of artificer armor and armed with a Fenrisian frost blade that clove warriors in two with a single strike, his fury was that of a pack hunter who knew his brothers were with him. Though the Thousand Suns sorcerer librarians could not see the Sisters of Silence, they were still there, for the librarians' psychic powers were weakening. The warriors of the Legio Custodes slew with powerful strikes of their guardian spears, hewing ceramite and flesh alike with their efficient killing strokes. The slaughtering continued as the Space Wolves quickly thinned the ranks of the beleaguered Thousand Suns. The doom of the Thousand Suns would soon be upon them, for fewer than 1,500 Astartes of the Legion remained alive. Facing many times their number and the fury of a Primarch like Lemon Russ, this was a battle which could only end one way. Unable to oppose the brutality of the Space Wolves, the Thousand Suns finally relented and unleashed their magic, their black sorcery upon their foes, but by doing so, they had inadvertently justified the Imperial sanction against them. Using their sorcery, the Thousand Suns pushed back the Space Wolves' assaults and slew a great number of the maddened warriors of Fenris. It seemed that the battle had turned and that the Thousand Suns might yet save the day. But just then, a new enemy opposed the Sorcerers of Prospero. The Silent Sisterhood finally made their presence fully known as the Null Maidens poured down from the black heaps of burning rubble and into the fight. They uttered no war cry or challenge as the blackness of their lack of presence in the warp washed across the Thousand Suns. They choked on the words of their conjurations, gagging upon the utterances of their spells. They staggered back, clutching at their throats, pawing at the neck seals of their helmets, blood spurting and leaking through their visor slits. Arcane gestures and motions ceased as their hands transformed into arthritic claws. Seconds after they had stunned and disempowered the sorcerers of the Thousand Suns with their insidious silence, the sisters struck, surging through the recoiled mass of space wolves and began to hack and slice with their power swords. Some of the captains of the Thousand Suns attempted to reform a line and launch a counterattack into the formidable lines of the space wolves. Using their psychic abilities, the Thousand Suns did manage to drive a wedge into their foe's line and firmly re-establish a defense. But this small victory was short-lived with the arrival of the Wolf King and the bodyguard of Terminators. The Thousand Suns line could not hold against the unbridled savagery of Lehman Russ, as their final stand was made in the shadow of the Pyramid of Fotep. Shards of crystalline glass floated on the waters surrounding Magnus the Red's lair. The surviving populace of Tiska, the pitiful few who survived the initial wrath of the invaders, sheltered within. The Thousand Suns also faced the wrath of the bestial Wolfen, the mutant Astartes of the Space Wolves who suffered from the genetic curse of the Canis Helix contained within their gene aid. The Wolfen's single-minded savagery was unlike anything the Thousand Suns had fought before, and they fell back from these newly unleashed terrors. 
horrified that the Space Wolves would dare employ such degenerate mutant abominations. The wolf unpunched many bloody holes in the Thousand Suns line tearing it wider with every second, and dozens of Astartes fell beneath the tearing blades of their claws. Howls of triumph filled the air, as the gap the Wolfen had opened was filled with custodies and space wolf warriors. Bands of Thousand Suns were surrounded and hacked down by frost blades and the glittering power fields of Guardian Spears. The Thousand Sun's first captain, Azek Ariman, backed along the great basalt causeway over the water towards the Pyramid of Fotep, their last refuge on Tiska. The best and bravest of the Legion, all that survived to sell their lives in sight of their Primarch, went with him towards the bronze gates which led inside. The howling of the wolfen built to a deafening crescendo, and high above, these howls were finally answered. Magnus the Red answered the pleas of his dying sons as he made his presence known. He presented a glorious sight, clad in golden artificer armor, his wild red hair ablaze with psychic energy. His flesh burned with the touch of immense power, greater than anything it had ever contained before. His bladed staff threw off blinding arcs of lightning which destroyed armored vehicles in thunderous explosions. Magnus swept his one good eye across the horrified space wolves, and all who met his gaze died in an instant as they were driven to madness by the Stygian depths of infinite chaos they saw there. Only Lehman Russ and his Fenrisian wolves stood unfazed by the sorcerous power of Magnus. Using his mighty sorcery, Magnus slowed down time in order to issue his final orders to his most gifted son and senior captain, bidding Ariman to lead the surviving Astartes of the Thousand Sons into the Pyramid of Fotep. There, Magnus's equerry Amon awaited him, bearing a priceless gift for Ariman to take away from Prospero. The Primarch reached down and touched the jade scarab in the center of Ariman's breastplate. The crystal shone with a pale light, and Ariman felt the immense power resting within. Magnus then explained that this crystal had been cut from the reflecting caves of Prospero, and that every Astartes of the Thousand Suns bore one set in their power armor. When the moment came, Ariman would know what it was meant to do, and that he was to concentrate all his psychic energies on the crystal and those of his battle brothers. Not fully comprehending his Primarch's cryptic words, Ariman reluctantly withdrew within the pyramid as instructed, followed by the remaining Thousand Suns. Once this was taken care of, Magnus once more restored the flow of time to its proper course. Masses of people filled the Pyramid of Fotep, terrified civilians and exhausted soldiers of the Spire Guard. The Thousand Suns poured inside, their armor black and dripping from the nightmarish deluge of ash drowning the world. The horrifying scale of the loss staggered Ariman. At a conservative estimate, he guessed that just over 1,000 Astartes had escaped the attack of the Wolfen. Less than 10% of the Legion had survived. Pushing down his grief, Ariman searched for Amon. The equerry held a chest up for Ariman to open. Ariman reached up and took hold of the lock, which snapped open at his touch. He opened the lid and drew in a breath as he saw the book within, its cover red and cracked with age, for it was none other than the legendary book of Magnus. Ariman was now its guardian. He understood with sudden clarity that Magnus had no expectation of surviving his duel with Lehman Russ. But it soon became clear that a number of his fellow Thousand Sons had also succumbed to the flesh change once again, including the Lorekeeper of the Corvidae cult. Dozens of Battle Brothers had to be put down, due to the sudden return of the rampant mutation. All told, only 1,242 Astartes had survived the raising of Prospero. The Crimson King and the Wolf King met in battle with the fate of an entire world balanced on the outcome, and they fought like the gods of ancient Terran legend. Forking traceries of lightning shot up from the ground, isolating them from the host of the Space Wolves and the Custodes. 
Russ rained down blow after blow on Magnus, shattering his horned breastplate, and in return Magnus struck his brother with a searing blast of cold fire that cracked his armor and set light to his braided hair. The Wolf King's frost blade struck at Magnus, but his golden power axe turned the blow aside as they spun and twisted in an epic battle. This was a battle fought on every level, physical, mental, and spiritual, with each Primarch bending every ounce of their considerable might to the other's destruction. Magnus used his powerful psychic magics, battering Russ with fists of telekinetic force wreathed in fire and lightning. Yet Russ was a Primarch, and such powers had little effect on him save to drive him to greater fits of anger. Magnus drove his fist into Russ's chest, the icy breastplate cracking open and shards of ceramite stabbed into the Wolf King's heart. In effect, Russ snapped Magnus's arm back, shattering it into a thousand pieces. A blade of pure thought unsheathed from Magnus's other arm, and he drove it deep into Russ's chest through his shattered armor. The psychic blade burst from Russ's back, and the Wolf King let loose with a deafening bellow of pain. A chorus from his Fenrisian wolves added their howls to that of their master. The two enormous monsters which accompanied Russ leapt upon Magnus, fastening their jaws upon his legs. Magnus slammed his fist into the black wolf's head, driving it to the ground, its skull shattered. With a bellow of anger, Magnus tore the white wolf from his leg with a thought and hurled it away over his head. Magnus and Russ were locked in battle high above the causeway to the pyramid. The furious horror of their struggle obscured by ethereal fire and bursts of lightning. A flare of black light erupted and Russ cried out in agony. His blade lashed out blindly and struck a fateful blow against Magnus's most dreaded weapon, his eye. Magnus reeled back from the Wolf King, one hand clutched to his eye, as his shattered arm crackled with regenerative energies. As broken and bloodied as Lehman Russ was, he was brawler enough to seize the opportunity. He barreled into Magnus and gripped him around the waist like a wrestler, roaring as he lifted his brother's body high above his head. All eyes turned to Russ as he brought Magnus down across his knee, and the sound of the Crimson King's back breaking tore through the heart of every Astartes of the Thousand Sons. The Wolf King howled his triumph to the blackened heavens. Russ dropped Magnus to the mud and brought the Frostblade Mjolnar around to take the head of his defeated brother. With the last of his strength, Magnus turned his head and his ravaged eye found his favorite son, Ahriman, and said, This is my last gift to you. Lehman Russ's blade swept down, but before its lethal edge struck, Magnus whispered eldritch words of power as his body underwent an instantaneous dissolution, its entire structure unmade with a word, and Ahriman gasped as vast power surged into his body. As it swept through him, he knew what he had to do. He knew everything about the gem, and pictured the identical artifact on the chest of every Astartes of the Thousand Sons. Even as he visualized them, the power in him spread to the entire Legion as Magnus gave the last of his power to save his sons. Teleporting his beloved and infamous city of Tisca to rematerialize upon the demon world which would henceforth be known as the planet of the sorcerers. This new world preserved all their precious knowledge hidden within its libraries that the Thousand Sons had gathered from across the galaxy during the Great Crusade. The Legion was saved from its enemies, at the cost of their souls. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Battle of Prospero and what Magnus did at its finale. I will be making at least one more video on Magnus, as there is still a lot to be said about his endeavors even after the Horus Heresy. If you were in his shoes, would you have allowed your city and legion to be wiped out, or would you have done as he did? and sacrifice them to chaos in the long run? Let me know in the comments below. If this video was fun or informative to you, please remember to click the like button and maybe subscribe for more videos. 
If you'd like to help out my channel, please go visit my Patreon page, the link for which is in the video description. I thank you kindly for watching, and I wish you a peaceful day. The Emperor Protects.